This program is a partnership of the Kansas City Public Library and Citizens Project, an initiative of the Citizens Association of Kansas City committed to open government since 1934. Tonight we're on location at the downtown public library here in Kansas City and you can expect some air turbulence because the topic is the future of KCI. It's currently one of the Metro's most publicly divisive issues. Should Kansas City be spending $1.2 billion on a new single terminal that aviation officials claim is desperately overdue? We have way too much space and terminal space that we need. The new terminal will actually be quite a bit smaller than the three that we have now. And just the expense of operating three separate facilities uh, year in, year out. Kansas City's three-terminal design was considered groundbreaking when the airport opened back in 1972, but airline consolidation and the huge cost of security have changed the way airports are run. The plan being considered by the city is to close terminals B and C and build a brand new facility on the site of Terminal A. But at what cost to you and your traveling convenience? I always like landing in Kansas City because you can get right to your car right to a cab and I like the convenience of the, of the gate. I've not seen any plans about somebody trying to use the existing buildings converting them. Use what we have. Sure you need to make some improvements but I think you're a solution in search of a problem. This hour we'll dissect those concerns and more. We're joined by aviation consultant Don Hensley, president of Safe Sky LLC, which among its specialties include airport expansion and development. During a more than 30-year career with the Federal Aviation Administration, Don managed three large terminal facilities, including St. Louis International, Dallas-Fort Worth, and KCI. Also with us are two of the 13 votes on the city council who will ultimately decide whether to move forward with this plan. Councilman Dick Davis, vice chair of the committee in charge of the airport, and Councilman Scott Wagner, who has yet to decide which way to vote. And commodities trader John Murphy, who founded the group Friends of KCI, which is leading the petition drive to force a public vote on the airport issue. Now, aviation director Mark Van Lowe declined to appear on the panel, saying he will not participate in any public forums until the mayor's task force has completed its work, which is not set to happen until the end of the year. But we did have the opportunity to speak to the aviation director about a year ago on Kansas City Week in Review, and he said this. People understand our issues when they're educated, when they're told. But to just say blindly, do you like it? Do you want it to change? Nobody wants it to change. No one. No one, no one wanted a new Sprint Arena. Now, everyone loves the Sprint Arena. Same thing with the airport. Is it the same thing, panel? The, the, the metropolitan area of Kansas City uh, would not fare well uh, in the entire world if they didn't have an airport. The lack of a Sprint Center will not have the same impact at all. They have to keep up with the times at Kansas City International doing something, whether it's build a single terminal, expanding the existing what they have to work with, and uh, the infrastructure. The buildings that they're in out there right now are 45 years old, and they're gonna be 50 before we even get started someplace else. So something needs to be done, and the question is, what is the best for Kansas City? And it may not be a single terminal, it may be combining something or doing something different. Okay. John. The, uh, the, the airport is, is something people need to actually function and, and, and work, uh, need it to work. People need to get there to jobs. People need to conduct business. Sprint Center is entertainment. It's, it's dressing on a cake. The actual meat and potatoes is the airport. You need to get in and out quickly, and it needs to be cheap and efficient. So why now, then? You know, when you ask why now, you're talking about a sense of urgency. What is the sense of urgency? And that's where I think you get into some of the issues that have had such pushback. 
you know, I'll, I'll, let, I'll rope this in to your, to your Sprint Center comment. With Sprint Center, a case was made beyond we need an arena. A case was made based on what may go into it, whether you agreed or disagreed with the sports teams going in, you knew you had a commitment from Sprint that said, we will sponsor this to help cover the cost. You had a partner who came forward and said, we'll not only put up money towards the construction, but we'll also uh, cover any operational losses. So you had a complete package. In this case, at least so far, we don't know what that complete package is, which helps us, or which helps us ask the question, what's our urgency? One reason we need a new terminal, according to the aviation director, is because of security. A screener workforce of 550 at KCI, according to the aviation director, while all three airports in the New York area use just 600. We have 14 checkpoints at KCI. Every airline has its own checkpoint. So they need a staff of people standing there to secure and, and make sure you're secure. In New York, you're put in a more efficient way of going through the terminal in one area screening and then you're able to move on your, your merry way. We don't do that here because we have three different terminals. It's, it's an astounding fact, and I was kind of surprised by it too. But that's another issue. The cost of the federal government to secure Kansas City is astronomical compared to other airports. And eventually, they're going to say, we're not going to pay for this anymore. Is there agreement, first of all, that something needs to be done of some kind, improvements to the airport? It's over 40 years old? Yeah. I mean, I, I yeah. Even, even you, John, who is leading the petition drive to put this the, on the ballot in Kansas City, Missouri? Improvements can always be made. OK. But something far less than a billion two. OK. What about the security issue? The security issue, as uh, you brought up that uh, uh, Director Van Lowe has said that uh, there are more screeners in Kansas City than all three New York airports combined. As a dyed-in-the-wool New Yorker, I'm from New York originally, that's completely false. Um, that Those numbers are wrong. And, um, you know, it, uh, anybody trying to get out of LaGuardia on a, on a Friday night, trying to, trying to funnel through thousands of people, takes forever. So. Uh, what we have at Kansas City with the, uh, with the present security situation is it, uh, because you have so many multiple points of entry, it is very quick and easy to get through the airport. The only time constraint you have is, is uh, before 8 o'clock in the morning, and that's because Southwest schedules about 10 flights before 8 a.m., and you have about 1,500 people trying to get through multiple security locations. W would a new single entry airport be, uh, location be better for that? No, it would make it worse. So we have a very good situation security-wise in Kansas City. Well, we disagree with that. Our per capita cost of security is one of the worst in the country. Uh, the tough reality is that we've got uh, a difficult security capability that uh, is one of the most expensive on a per uh, trip basis in the country, and it needs to be improved. Is that a justification for a new airport? Absolutely not. But security, uh, in terms of a cost, is uh, very high relatively in Kansas City versus other airports in the country. Another issue that comes into play is the whole environmental issue. The aviation director, Mark Van Lowe, if he was here, would be making an issue of that too. We have three terminals. All those gates, airlines are de-icing at their gates. And that fluid, which is very, very bad to the environment when it gets into our waterways, is just running everywhere. We would have to tear up all the concrete aprons around the three terminals and put in drainage systems and fuel systems. And, and that's just one aspect of, of one of the reasons that we're looking at a new terminal. Don, is that a justifiable issue for looking at a, a major new terminal? Well, Nick, uh, they could uh, not necessarily have to do a new terminal to, to correct the de-icing area. They could build a de-icing pads in order to make that work. In other words, you go to most other big, big places, and you'll see where the person actually gets off the gate, the captain, the crew gets out of the gate and goes to a de-icing pad because of the lifespan of de-icing fluid and what it takes from the time you actually push from a gate. So um, there's, there's fixes to doing something different than building a new terminal to fix it by just building de-icing pads that are currently exist at, at MCI like they've done at many other airports. Yes. Can I want to say that we agree that uh, the de-icing problem can be fixed without building a new terminal. Okay. I'd like to add one thing. I, I think, and I have not talked to 
Mark Manlow about any of this, haven't had any discussion with anybody about this other than when I was asked to participate on this group. I think they right now meet the EPA requirements for capturing the deicing fluid. They have a system that does that. They have a drainage system under the terminal or right at the gates that does cap capture that. So um, I don't know why that seems to be even an issue. Uh, because they're, if they weren't meeting that criteria now, guess what? They wouldn't be doing it. Okay, right. Do you have any more? Inf okay, C Councilman Davis. Or? I, I would, if I could, I'd like to go back to the question that you asked first, and that's why now. And uh, our position is not now. The mayor has appointed a task force. Uh, that task force, uh, to our understanding, is going to explore every one of the issues uh, regarding this proposal. They're going to look at uh, are there other options to it. Uh, they're going to look at the cost of uh, can we refurbish uh, terminals B and C to the point that uh, could we refurbish them at uh, a lesser cost than the 1.2 for a new terminal. Uh, and I think that uh, this council is waiting for the recommendation from that, com that, uh, that group. I can tell you that I would be very surprised if we'd get two votes to build a new terminal if they come out and recommend it, say it's a bad idea. So I think the council, uh, the, mayor, the mayor said we've obviously got a problem with a lack of understanding of where we're going. We're going to slow this process down. We're going to look at the issue again. I would also tell you there's a lot of us that have discussed the issue of a public vote. Uh, I think that uh, the probability is that if we do this, we'll need a public vote because we'll probably use revenue bonds. I've talked to several council that agree with a position that I have, and that is that if we spend a billion dollars, you don't do that without a public vote. Uh, so I think, I think several members of the council will say, say the beauty of democracy is that irrespective of what the professionals tell us, if we don't have support from the public, we don't do things. What's your perspective on that, uh, Councilman Wagner? On which question? Well, the, the, <laughs> the public vote aspect of all of this. Sure. Well, I, we started with a plan, uh, a, a second master plan from Mark Van Lowe. We, three of us, I was one of them, said, I don't like it. And then it went up from there. And so we have so much conjecture now of this is why we're doing it, and this is what it will look like, and this is what it will do. It's very hard to say with any you know, being definitive at all, what it is that we're actually asking the public to pay for. Yes, and, and talking about confusing, you tried to do a petition drive, John Murphy, as part of your Fly KCI group, and were told that wasn't actually legal to do. Isn't that correct? That, that was correct. It was a resolution, not an ordinance. So we, we were not allowed to, we, the city attorney, Bill Geary, threw it out. In response, we launched another petition drive to basically get on the ballot uh, a component, uh, an ordinance, a law that said the city will not be able to tear down or replace the, the terminals at KCI without a public vote first. And if the city or the, uh, the city hall wants to, uh, uh, wants to be upfront about this, they should adopt that ordinance and say, you're right, we're not going to tear down this airport without coming to you first. And in terms of financing the airport, there are debt mechanisms out there that, that will not require a public vote. Secured lease obligation bonds are, are, are a way to get around it, where you use the airport as, a, as an asset, and a developer and a bank come in, put a lien on the asset, develop the airport, and then you're on the hook for payments for 30 years. Those are, municipalities do that all the time. Let, let's talk about the, who pays for all of this. $1.2 billion. The aviation director, Mark Van Lowe, appeared on KCPT about a year ago and said this. We've been paying for new terminals all around the country forever. Every time we fly, there's the look in the bottom of your ticket next time. You may spend $69 to go to Denver, but there's another $60 in taxes on that. So all of us who fly in Kansas City have been paying into this huge pot of money in Washington. And I heard people even on, even on the program say, well, why can't we take some of this money and build roads with it? Well, that's not how the federal government is set up. When we pay gasoline tax in Missouri, some of that money comes back to Missouri to build highways. Some of it goes to Washington, never to be seen for again. So what I'm saying is all this money is being collected in Washington for airports. It's our turn to get some of that money back in this area and build a new facility. So it's not money that we are paying for in our tax dollars for this airport. 
It's money that we've already paid, for instance, to build Denver's new airport and all of those other glamorous airports where we buy our Brooks Brothers shirts or golf shirts or whatever else in those other malls that we see in those other airports. Is that the case, Don? Well, it's partially correct, I think. There partially? Are other funding, yeah, there, there are other fundings that is used to uh, expand an airport. There's the airport improvement uh, money that goes in at the Aviation Trust Fund that has money available. It's collected through the fuel taxes, the landing fees, and, and all of the things that go into running an airport to, to, to support it. And uh, Kansas City International has been one who's done a great job, and it's, uh, since it went out there in 1972, it's, it has not required any money from any one citizen in this city to support that airport. In fact, it supports the downtown airport. So it's, it's a revenue maker for us. Uh, with regards to the money. So the funding that's going to be done with what I understand based on what's been said, not one person here, other than unless you fly a lot, is going to pay extra money for that airport. If you don't fly, you're not going to pay for it. Councilman Wagner. Uh, you know, this was one of the issues that I think was a great surprise, at least to me, when this second master plan was presented. Because the assumption going in was exactly what you said. You know, we've paid for everybody else. Time for them to ante up and pay for us. And so the question then became, what is it that we should expect? And the first answer was, well, we would ask for 600 million. Okay, so half of it will be paid that way. Well, as it always starts, it, it, we shouldn't expect to get that. We may get half of that. So now 300 million. Okay, is that, is that what we should expect? Well, we, we would never say that's what we're going to get. And so, you know, you begin to question at that point, what is it that I have been told and what is it should I, that I should expect? And even if you take a look at what uh, the trust fund is now managing to give out, those, those dollar amounts are becoming less and less. And so, you know, for me, that's a big question mark. I have a $1.2 billion you know, piece of, of property or, or project that I'm going to do, but now I don't know what I should expect for the federal government to fund, and I don't know what the users of the airport will now have to fund. And that's a big problem. John Murphy. The federal government's broke. Um, it, it is. I, that's no secret. <laughs> the, there are other airports in, in the country that are in, worse, in far worse shape than KCI is. So I would think that that money would go there first. And I think Sam Graves has said that there's really going to be no money, no federal dollars coming in. So where's the money coming from? Well, because the airport is an enterprise fund and it doesn't, and it doesn't uh, come out of the direct general fund of taxes for the city of Kansas City, it means higher rates and fees for people who use the airport. Now there are two, two types of customers that use the airport. There's us, the consumer, and the airlines. Now, I don't want to pay higher ticket prices, I don't want to pay higher parking, uh, parking fees, and I don't want to have, uh, go out and buy a $30 hot dog. The airlines now, uh, they're another consumer. And I had a conversation yesterday with a large carrier who has raised concerns to Mark Van Lowe. And his two concerns are this. What's this going to do to ticket prices? Because if ticket prices go up dramatically and people don't fly in, fl want to fly out of KCI, I'm not flying in there with, with my jets. And two, his question was, how are you going to finance this? And, 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 the, and I said, well, okay. what are you? OK, this is a good, good point. Does it have any impact on ticket prices? They're going to go up. Why, why would it go up? Does it have to go up? But, but Don, you, you have been in lots of other markets. You were in Dallas, Fort Worth, St. Louis. When they did their airport expansions, did their ticket prices go up? Well, I can't. Ticket I can't, fees? You know, I don't have the data, and I haven't gone back and studied that. But you know, the passenger facility charge, the PFC, I think they call it, uh, is controlled by Congress. They're the ones that control how that's used or done. And I, you know, I talked to several major airports out there, and they usually, every facility charges the maximum amount they can charge. So will it go up? It may go up, but it's not going to be significant. I can't see it going up significant because of one facility building it because it's, it's regulated. Okay. So okay. the PFC but, think, but things that would be in the uh, purview of Kansas City would be parking fees could go up. Okay. So when John talks about other fees going up, parking fees, what else would might what might Kansas City and see a difference in, if not their taxes, uh, what else might go up? Concession revenue will double. Concession revenue. The amenities is an attractive part, according to Mark Van Lowe. He says this. 
There is nothing to eat, nothing to do. Uh, and, and those of us who live here, I don't need to go to a shopping mall at the airport. I'm just going to get on my plane and I'm going to go. But a lot of people connecting here and are traveling here and stuck here um, really are in a concrete bunker. There's, there's nothing for them. And we could earn probably $15 million a year in revenues from concessions. So it's not a small number. It's a big deal to airports. So it's not a small number, it's a big deal for airports. I think it's a consideration. The, uh, one of the realities of this airport, it is probably the worst place to get stuck if you're gonna get stuck for four hours. I just had to fly to uh, Phoenix uh, two weeks ago, and we had a four hour layover in Albuquerque. I was with my wife and my granddaughter, and it was a very pleasant four hours. An awful lot to do inside security. You can't do that at this airport. You have to leave security to do it. It's the worst place to get stranded for four hours on a flight. Now, does that make a difference? Well, I guess if you're a regular flyer and you're going from St. Louis to Phoenix uh, and you knew you had a layover in Denver or Kansas City, you'd probably prefer to go to the De Denver one because it's a better airport to get stuck in. And people do get stuck in airports, and that's one of the things that's tough about airport. It is uh, as bad as you can get for a major city in terms of availability of amenities for the person that... Uh, is stuck here for two, three, four hours. Councilman Wagner, how is this airport used? Is it used as a hub or is it some place you travel out of to get to a hub? Um, I think the general uh, percentage is for a non-hub city, 80 to 90 percent of the people going through are from that area. If you're a hub, it's only 60 percent. And that's where those sorts of amenities really come in handy because it is a hub, so you're going there and then you're going somewhere else. The real question is then, for the sake of those 10 to 20 percent, can you really achieve that amount of money? But that's ultimately what it boils down to. We are not a hub. Therefore, it's not been a big consideration for, the, for, many, for most of the users because the general number of users, by a large margin, are these folks here. Still to come on this special Kansas City Week in Review, we get to your questions on the future of KCI. But first, ever wondered why your luggage tags in Kansas City say MCI? Mid-Continent International was the original name for Kansas City's airport, a nod to its hometown carrier, Mid-Continent Airlines. That's where local historian Bill Worley says MCI got its name. The decision was made that it should become Kansas City International. Uh, in other words, that the airport should have a designation that would refer to the city as opposed to a location in the country. But the MCI code stuck, and efforts to change the designation to KCI were blocked at the time because call letters beginning with K's and W's were reserved for broadcast stations and not for airports. Over the years, that ban has been lifted, but that coveted name now has been registered to another city. If your luggage is headed to KCI, then you're in for a big surprise because that happens to be the three-letter code for Kono, Indonesia. For KCPT, I'm Cody Tapp. Many of you may be reaching for your air turbulence bags at this point in the program, but I want to hear from you. Could you name, say, the five items that are the biggest problem with KCI right now that you'd like to rectify with a new airport? If we build an airport today, we would never build one that used a red bus to get you between uh, parking uh, gates. Uh, the, uh, uh, we should be able to get between all of the gates. Uh, you all know that moving from gates in B to C requires a red bus trip. Last time I took it, it took me 20 minutes to do so, and uh, it happens. People get stuck with flying in on uh, an American that goes into one terminal, uh, leaving on uh, uh, Southwest and Terminal B, and they have to get between the gates, and you go by the red bus. Now, <laughs> theoretically, what we ought to do is we ought to have a people mover that goes between the airports. And we're going to keep B and C, do something so we're not stuck with the red bus for 40 years for the next people that want to transfer between terminals. Find a way so that you can walk from any gate to any other gate. It'd be great if we could build a people mover, but earlier studies said it would cost a quarter of a billion. John Murphy. Uh, many of us live in homes that are approaching the 100-year uh, year mark. Um, every time my air conditioner goes out, my boiler goes out, or something happens, uh, I, 
my wife might advise us, but we don't vote on it and it doesn't turn out this way, why don't we tear down and build a new house? What you do is you, you fix as you need and, and plan and, and you keep it relevant. What you don't want to do is go out and spend a billion dollars on something that could be fixed for a couple of million dollars. Uh, for instance, the parking issue. Okay, I have driven to, to, to B and have cursed that there's no parking in the B terminal. That can be easily rectified by the Aviation Authority by taking uh, the, two, you have the two busiest air carriers in the city, Southwest, which is, takes 44% of the flights in and out of here, and Delta, which takes almost 20, and you have them in the same terminal. Move one to the other terminal. Then you'd have a lot more room. And that, how much would that cost? John? The thing that, that bugs me the most is how they have actually funneled the security issue into one area versus using both ends of the terminal, having two entry points, or build something in between the two terminals and make a single point of entry there and then go to either terminal. The, the, the security issue is the most frustrating of all of it, plus how they manage their red bus and blue bus program. Move them off of the inner curb, put them on the outer curb, and the last item that bugs me is the police department. And I hope I don't get a ticket tonight. But <laughs> it, well, it's a, it's, a, it's a city police or the airport police. Uh, you go out there and it's right when it's the 8 o'clock rush or it's the whatever rush it is. And you go out there and there's four police cars parked against the curb where people come and go. Park their car over in the parking lot and walk over and manage the traffic. But don't take up four spots at each place <laughs> You know, that, that just irritates me beyond. I can't believe it. I've, 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 okay, real quick. So that's, that's my issue. First of all, I have a 100-year-old house, and I still want to know why my taxes are going to go up 35%. But, <laughs> you know, and there is no magic money. And I think we, we think of this as a sunk cost, that, you know, this money's just going to come from some magical place. But at $10 a head, even for an airport tax, that's at 10 million passengers, it's going to take 15, 20 years to pay off revenue bonds. And, and trust me, every time I rent a car, I pay for the Sprint Center, never go there. So there's a lot of things I have to, to, to say about this. The problem with the airport is the TSA. We've taken these beautiful terminals and we've cut them down the middle with secure and unsecured areas. So, and I hope your camera actually picks this up over here. Because we've got props. Okay. This, this one probably cost a couple hundred thousand dollars to put on a cab. Today with my post-it notes, and I liked your idea that, you know, we basically have two secure entrances. And let's make those areas where you come in and out, get screened, and uh, let people wander through the areas, actually enjoy the concessions as they come in and out. And I'm sure $600 million to repair foundations is still a little less than $1.2 billion. Nick, can I make a comment to that, to yes. that point? Um, you know, Scott. Thank you. Um, one of the things that it reminded me of is this plan that we have been discussing and is now into this committee was not the first plan brought forward by the Aviation Department. Originally, a single term, a single uh, uh, terminal was going to be on the south side of the, of the present airport adjacent to Highway 152. That was the plan until it was decided that MoDOT was not going to spend the $500 million necessary to do all the new interchanges and all the new uh, roadways that would have to be built to go into a new airport on the south side. So all of a sudden, that plan, which we all knew about, was gone in favor of a new one. To say anything is set in stone, and I think to, to my colleague's point, um, this is still very fluid. And to say that we know what it's going to be is, in my view, an error. One aspect in all of this that we haven't talked about tonight and will be critically important is what are the airlines going to commit to? What are they going to do? Are they, we kind of referred to it just a little bit ago, but in any airport that is being built in any city in the United States, you know what the commitment of the airlines is. In Salt Lake City, Delta's throwing in money. Uh, in, uh, in Texas and in Houston, uh, they're doing the same. There's not been an airport that hasn't been built without knowing what the airlines will do. And, and I have to do this just because I just have to. This 
is the actual program from the dedication of Kansas City International Airport in 1972. And, um, and, and, and you won't find it on eBay later, I'll assure you. Uh, but um, in it, it gives tremendous credit to TWA, who at the time kicked in millions of dollars uh, for, for not only the airport itself, but obviously its overhaul base and everything else. So I say all that to say, until we even know what the airlines are going to do, you don't know what the commitment is going to be or needs to be to do anything on a new terminal or anything else. Thank you very much, Madam. Yes. The first part of my comment should really be for the aviation director, but I'm going to ask... I'm speaking for him tonight. You are. I've got all his, all okay. his quotes here from the last three years. But I'm, I'm hoping... <laughs> for the last three years. Okay. I'm hoping that perhaps one of the councilmen will pass on my comments. Um, what I'm hearing is that many things cannot be fixed because they need to be upgraded. My question is, why aren't the things that can be fixed not being fixed. I have flown out of KCI three times since March 1st. Each time I have been there, I have seen signs of neglect. The last time I was there, it was a stall door in the women's bathroom. I could have fixed it myself with a screwdriver. <laughs> you want to see some disgruntled women? When you don't maintain things, you are going to get disgruntled people. They're not disgruntled because of the configuration of the airport. They're disgruntled because of what they are encountering. And I think people are saying, oh, they don't like KCI. But why don't they like KCI? It's simply not being maintained the way it should. And I hope that you will pass that on. And the other one, you act, my, the second part of my question, you actually addressed a little bit. I, um, in all of my reading yet, none of the airlines has come out in favor of a change. Until they do, why are we pursuing this? Why aren't we doing more to see what they want? Mm -hmm. if, if I may. Yes. Uh, I, you actually go with a hammer and a screwdriver to KCI yeah. Airport when you travel to fix things, don't you? And, 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 and a couple two by fours not, if they're necessary. Not to my knowledge, but, no. But no, I mean, the, the point about what the airlines will do is critical in this whole discussion. Uh, you know, we've talked about, um, in our own discussions at the council level, we've talked about Charlotte, Indianapolis, Austin, what we would consider our peer cities, and they've built new airports. And in every case, there is airline participation. So in order to know, you know, if I were to, if, if I were to say to you today, I can tell you we've got a commitment for 20 new nonstop flights out of KCI if we do a new terminal. Could that change someone's opinion? Yes, mine. Yeah, it could. <laughs> but I don't know. I don't know that. Nobody knows that. And I think what's, for me, when we voted on this particular issue at council, not knowing what that commitment was and then saying, for example, we're going to pay $1.2 billion. In Indianapolis's case, they paid $1.1 in 2008, but they had airline participation. So again, it kind of goes back to what my, I earlier said about Sprint Center. You knew the deal, and you knew everybody who was going to be involved with the deal, so you could say whether or not this was a good business decision. We're not there yet. We're not. Don. We're going to have to do something sometime. You can't be a 100-year-old terminal and make this work. Now, I understand the old house and all that stuff. But, you know, I was the manager of Kansas City International when the tower out there was full with asbestos. And I had to evacuate that building for four months and run air traffic control out of a trailer and out of remote radar sites. We put a new tower in. And you know what? A large part of the community said, you don't need a new control tower. You don't need a new tower. You don't need a new radar room. You don't need a new runway. Well, we've got one of the best airports in the country as a result of that. We've got the best airspace around here. We have the capacity to handle 99 airplanes an hour to land there because somebody stepped up and did it, all right? Whether it's a new terminal, I have serious questions about whether or not this concept's the best, but we have to do something. But to go from 90 gates to 37, I don't think is the answer. And, and the, the concept, the way they have it laid out, I have major concern with, with capacity in the alleys, as we call it in the air traffic business, where you've got 10 aircraft parked in a U-shape enclosed. You back one out, 
and it has a mechanical and it can't move, you block five gates. I don't know that they've thought all that out, but there is something that needs to be done. What it is, we don't know. But I think they need to take another look at how they're going about this and make it a, a, a unique and a special place because Kansas City is a great airport. Good. Anybody else want to comment on that? Okay. Madam, your question, please. One of the issues I think that it's important is to deal with this in context, and that is we, Kansas City, Missouri is 320 square miles with only 450,000 people to pay for that infrastructure. And we have an airport at one end of a very long linear city. So Kansas Cityans drive a long way because we don't have transit, we don't have, uh, ta you know, taxis are expensive. Most people around here drive. So if you can get on an airplane within an hour of leaving downtown, it's an important economic issue and that I think we may, even if, I don't know what the numbers are on security personnel, but I know how much time I would have to spend out of my business if I have to take four hours to get to the airport and get through the systems and park and all of that kind of thing. So the, the joint economic impact from the other side of the table, not what the city pays, not what the feds pay, and not what the airlines pay, but what comes out of our pocket, the amount of money that costs businesses in Kansas City needs to be taken into consideration on this equation. Okay, but doesn't Mark Van Lowe, the aviation director, say even with this new airport, it could be just as convenient and easy as the current airport. Well, if it can, then what is that? What does that mean? He, he has certainly said that. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and it is not for me to agree or disagree if that's, if that's the case. You know, we, I will say, Nick, that you know, we equate so far in this discussion, we have equated convenience with one thing, and that is your ability to go from the parking lot across the terminal to the terminal and to your gate and so on. We have not talked about if you have other flights, does that save you from, from having to stay at another airport for several hours, which goes into that equation. Um, so, th so there's so many things that, that get into that, but, but time is the issue, ultimately. How much time do you have to work your way through the system to get from your home to your ultimate destination? Yes. And, and, and we haven't seen that so yes. far. Who else wanted to discuss that, Dawn? Well, the, the amount of time we spend in the airport is important, and the amount of time to get through the system is important. Will the 37 gates of the new terminal be as efficient as what we're currently doing at Terminal B with 30 gates going, or whatever the number is, but it's pretty close to that, I guess, based on what I understand? Yeah, it'll be about, as, about the same efficiency, but beyond that, will it be? I don't know. And, you know, why would, my, my biggest concern is why do we want to take an airport that has the ability to, to have 90 gates well managed with the right amount of security, two points, and condense it to 37 gates? I mean, that's my biggest concern from uh, if I was going to pay for it as a user or a passenger or tax dollars or whatever. Common sense says that just doesn't make sense. And if you're stuck with 37 gates and you close down the other two terminals, then you are stuck with that operation. Right now, we got the ability to expand to 90 gates. If we had two airlines walk in here tomorrow and say, you know what, Kansas City's got a population base that will support 400 departures a day out of here, they couldn't do it with 37 gates, number one. They could today with, with the 90. Who are these airlines who are coming here wanting to do well, this? And I, and I, yeah. Let me add one yeah, thing. Please. The population base is what drives the need for the airlines for this city. And you don't have the population base to have 400 departures. You, you, you don't have it. The highest we ever got to is about 270. I was out there when we got there, okay, and that was when Brandon was going to put 254 departures out. And the day we were trying to figure out what we're going to do with the new runway and how we're going to do it, Brandon mount, announced bankruptcy. And then they tied up all the gates for two years in court. And so we got to be careful of what we do and say. You got to trust your aviation officials to do the right thing for this city and that airport. Yes. Okay. Anybody else on that? Okay, Dick. If you're going to do that, Councilman Davis, I'm just going to uh, fiddle with you for a moment, and I mean that in a non-freaky way. Uh, Should I avert uh -huh. my eyes? If there are any attorneys here, uh, please. Okay. That's just between you and us. Okay. Fine. I yes. Will, I will tell Sorry you, for I fiddling feel very with you. Fiddled. Councilman Davis, you had something interesting to say. The airport design is for 37 gates, but it's uh, 
we have 5,000 acres, and it's designed in such a way that all of the uh, extensions of the airport can be extended. So uh, 37 gates is the initial design, but we can make it uh, a lot bigger if we need to. Could one of the solutions we haven't considered thus far be actually moving to the airport to the um, demolished site of the former Bannister Mall? We might find that out because we have the city councilman who represents that area, great Councilman idea. John Shaw. Great idea, great idea. Okay. Uh, well, thank you, Nick. Uh, and I agree, I think okay, that's right. super, but uh, I, I don't want to pretend that I'm unbiased on this because on the council I voted against uh, this plan twice, so obviously I have a, a point of view. But, and, and I don't have a lot of faith that this study commission is going to do anything except recommend single terminal. Uh, you see the folks on it, and there's some great folks on it, but it, of the folks I know, it sure seems that there are a lot more proponents than there are people that, that haven't made up their mind yet. How, how does the public, and I'd like to direct this to my colleagues really, how, how does the public get into the equation the, the value of this being what I think most of us here feel is the most customer friendly airport in the nation? Because it seems like we're, we're spending a lot of time on shopping and how we can do more shopping up there. Well, I don't go to the airport to go shopping, and I don't think most people here do. How can we get that customer convenience again, given the weight it should be given. Because uh, I think all of us realize we have to do major modernization at the airport. But I'd like to do that major modernization and not destroy customer convenience and make this just one other airport where you have to wait forever to go through security, walk forever to get to your gate, and spend forever before you get on the flight. Well, council members, do you agree, first of all, with Councilman Sharp's contention that this really is sort of they are, are this task force, when they come up with their conclusions, which apparently will be at the end of the year, will come forward and say, yes, we're going to build a single terminal at $1.2 billion? Well, I won't feed the cynicism behind that remark, although he could okay. be absolutely right. But who knows? <laughs> um, I, I've got a lot of faith in, in some of those folks on there. I, here's the thing from my perspective. You want to make sure that Every issue has been covered in some form or fashion with an opportunity for people to comment on that and to be injected in that process. If that hasn't happened, if we don't look at convenience, but I would also say, and it's another issue we haven't touched on so far, are the economic development implications of an airport. We haven't talked about that yet, and that's part of it too. There are a number of topics that have to be discussed and that have to have public input. If they don't, then that, the process that we have been waiting on or will wait on will have failed, and then we will be right back where we are. And so, you know, I, I have to, I'll be an optimist today. By the end of the year, I may be a pessimist, but I think Councilman Sharp is right that those issues have to be discussed and people do have to have an opportunity to comment. Councilman Davis. All I was going to say is that I think that uh, Mr. Sharp would agree that uh, we will absolutely not go to the public till we have our questions answered. We are not, this council will not accept the report that appears to be a rubber stamp. I think this council will try to make sure that the questions are answered before we go to the public. But John, would I not have your vote to go to the public with whatever we proposed at the end of this process? Ooh, well, I, I certainly wouldn't support something uh, trying to finance it, and I know there are discussions going on on how to finance it without going to a vote of the public, although That's most people point. would say it would cost a lot more money. Uh, but if, but uh, if they haven't made a good case, I'm, I'm not going to use the cop out and say, well, we'll just let the public decide. If I think it's a bad idea, I'm going to vote no. But uh, I, I would not support anything where, where you're committing a billion dollars plus without a public vote, I think that'd be terrible for the city to do. John, John Murphy, even though Councilman Sharp wanted to address this, wanted to address this to his fellow colleagues on the council, where though is that role for the public to still be involved in this? Well, well Nick, at the end of the day, we're the people in charge. We want the, we want the ability and the right, and we demand it, to have a say on this. And there's a lot of people in the city that, that, that have, have seen things happen, like the streetcar, where they felt that they were left out of the decision-making process. 
This is a big issue. We don't want this thing to be, we, want, we don't want to be saddled with this debt for the next couple of decades. It's, it's, it's up to us, and we, we want to have a say on it whether we do it or not. And that's all our petition asks. Give us a say first. Before, don't tear it down before we have a chance to say yay or nay. Yep. Sir, your question is next. I now, sure, you need to make some improvements. But I think there's a lot of things like you're in Kansas City happens, you're a solution in search of a problem. We're not going to be a hub. Demographics against it. There's only four major airlines right. left, let's face it. So how many people actually transfer at KCI? And the gentleman's worried about eating, our councilman, you enjoy one of the clubs the airlines run. Huh? And they'll take care of you and give you a drink, too. <laughs> That's all I got to say. Thank, Thank you. you very much, sir. All right, we're going to keep going. Your, your question, sir. Uh, how are you doing? Good to see you. Good to see you, Nick. Thank you for coming. You're from Wales, and we talked about that. Yes, absolutely. Same My, hometown as Richard Burton and Anthony Hopkins. There we go. Yeah. All righty. <laughs> My name is Lloyd Frank, spell with two L's. All righty. As a Welchman would. Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> I'm an engineer in town, and what I'm thinking about is the airport is a, is a big traffic jam. <clears throat> There's more parking up there than there are places to park airplanes, for automobiles, that is. And what I propose is a subway up to the airport with uh, two connections at each. Let me see if I got that piece of paper here, two connections at each uh, terminal. It, would it be and fair to say, though, if we bother in to spend this much money to improve the airport, we should at least incorporate some form of transportation to the airport, well, yes, well, like something that. progressive, like something, a subway? Something very fast. Is, is, that, is that a... a you got it. You figured it out. Um, Dick Davis, not only were you the first director of the Mid-America Regional Council, you were also the head of the Kansas City Area Transportation Authority. You think intelligently about transit. How, how does that sound? Uh, it sounds wonderful. Uh, Great. I... OK. So, um, <laughs> so we have a public vote that's going to be on this. No? OK. I'm going a little far. I got applause. I'm through. OK, all right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the tough reality is, in my years at ATA, we looked uh, at that airport revenue the uh, parking at the airport is, generates $40 million a year. That's $5 for every dollar you get out of the fare box at ATA. We would have loved to find a way to use some of that parking revenue to provide uh, a better transit connection. It is absolutely cannot be done. The Federal Aviation Administration has control over what you do with airport revenues and what the FAA says is we helped you build that airport. Now, when you generate revenue at that airport, you spend it on that airport. So you couldn't, so spend, could you, so you couldn't spend one dime on no. the airport improvements to do something could that not. helps? Could not. With that, no? Could but you not. could do the people mover that oh, you talked yes. about, people but you couldn't do terminals? the subway part that goes into the airport. Absolutely could not. Okay, Lloyd? How does that, so you're not happy with that, are you? No. How did the audience feel about the plan? Favorable? Okay. Thank you for coming in to do this with us. Thank you. Sir, your question? I'd like to approach it at a different angle from this altogether. There's an issue that we haven't looked at. Come closer to the microphone? Thank there, you. There's an issue we haven't taken much of a look at. Okay. And that's the future of the airline industry, period. And I think that's being seriously overlooked today. My last job was, was in the steel industry. I was in charge of writing off half the Kansas City steel industry and half of the Midwest steel industry for Armco. And in a five-year period, I watched an industry completely implode that six years before that, they were telling me, build, 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 build. And I'd like to point out a couple of things that are affecting the airline industry, and I think are going very, very serious. First one is electronic conferencing. The second thing, the unending spiral energy costs are going to make tickets higher. It's just going to, that's a given. I don't think anybody can argue with that fact. The, the third thing, unemployment and the underemployment of the, the new graduates and college kids is going to significantly affect the way airline travel is taken over the next few years and how much it's utilized. They're not going to travel as much because they don't have as much money to blow. Simple as that. A so, solo, so the implications of that is that Kansas City shouldn't be spending the money the, on the airport? No, no. The implication is that Kansas City should look very carefully and what's happening to the industry before they spend a billion, too. We need to be seriously looking at these factors. 
We have a lot of people in this which room. Which is why, which I assume is why they're looking at, they've got so much excess capacity mm. currently, why they want to be in just one terminal with just 30 plus gates instead of 90 something gates now. Well, and, and I would add to that, and this is one of the other issues that came out in the presentation to the council, and again, it was a reason for pause, at least for me. The, there is an estimate of what the growth in passengers in KCR are going to be. And consistently, it's about a 1% growth, no matter what you do. And that's really the question as you look at what do you expect to have happen at a new airport? Do you get more passengers? Right now, those estimates would say no matter what you did, it's going to be a consistent climb and not a big one. And that's part of the reason why you know, we, we have to really study what can happen if you get a new airport. Right now, the jury's still out on if you would get any, any more significant growth than what we already expect to have. John, um, you know, if you look at the numbers from 2000 to now, our airport, uh, uh, the numbers at our airport of people traveling out has declined. One of the things you brought up is how's technology, what's technology going to do to the airline industry? Well, you know, in 1972, when uh, KCI was first built, it was a regulated industry. It was a very different business model. Uh, late 70s, early 80s, you had deregulation. That changed the business model completely. You, you, you never saw airlines go bankrupt in the, before, before the 80s. Well, airlines have gone out of business. One other thing that they have to, the vector they have to put into their, their considerations is what is technology going to do to business travel? Look, I travel, I've traveled a lot for business in my, in my years. If I can get on some kind of screen and have a meeting and be home that night, it's great. It saves your company money. And now that we're a Google Fiber City or when we're a Google Fiber City, that's going to have huge major implications for, for, for air travel across the country. Thank you very much, sir. We have time for one more question. Your question, sir? I'm last. I've not seen any plans about somebody trying to use the existing buildings, converting them. Have we spent any money? Has anybody looked at that? Do we have any kind of plans whatsoever to say, hey, can we use B and C, A and B, build something in between where they can, people get across and, and make it use what we have, use our resources that we already have? I think that would be Councilman discussed Davis. extensively by the Mayor's Citizens Group. I think it will be discussed extensively. I think the citizens group is going to want answers to that. I think we'll get good answers to that before we go any further. Where do we go from here? Uh, we have this 24-person citizens group appointed by the mayor, appointed in May, and we're told that they're meeting. They're talking about all of these items. Um, when are they supposed to come out with their final recommendations? It'll be later this year, although... Later this year? Mm -hmm. be before the end of the year? Mm -hmm. Councilman Wagner? That is my understanding. Okay, December? Don't hold me to it, I'm not on the Christmas? <laughs> no? Okay. But by the end of the year, we're right. supposed to know, and they're then they're going to provide recommendations to the City Council or to the Mayor? To the City Council? Both. To both? Okay. And then you have a chance to then look at that and say you have to accept them or you vote on them or what happens? I would say there's going to be due diligence. I would say that uh, every one of that, every member of that council is going to want to be convinced that the recommendation is the right one. Every councilman is going to be very aware of the issues that have been raised. Every councilman is going to be very aware of the concerns for people that would prefer that we stay in B and C. And there will not be a quick decision, and it shouldn't be. We're talking about spending a billion dollars. We're talking about spending a billion dollars if we say B and C. I guarantee you we're talking about a big expenditure that, that faces this council. We're not going to be in any hurry to make a decision until we know what we're doing. If, uh, I'm not going to tell you we'll be satisfied with that in December. What I will tell you is that uh, uh, we're, we're a council that works well together. I think we will eventually reach consensus. We will address the issues that have been raised. And when we're ready to go to the people, we'll know what we're talking about when we go. Will there be a public vote on this? Right. Is that your, your view in, in the year 2014, next year? Uh, if we reach a conclusion that we're ready for one. Are you expecting a public vote on this in 2014, next year, I, I Councilman would, Wagner? I would say yes, with the caveat that if you don't know what the airlines will do as part of that overall package, then there's nothing to vote on because there's no package to go out. It, if, it's just like, just like I said at the beginning, you know, you have to have a package. If you don't have a package to vote on, 
you, you have an idea and nothing more. And that's what we'll see if we have when we, when, we, uh, when we see the recommendations come out. If we still don't have any idea what the airlines will do, if we still don't know um, what, uh, what a terminal what might look like and what conveniences might be in there, if we don't have answers to all these questions and many, many more, I don't see anything going for a vote. But presumably, let's presume that that comes out, yes, we probably would. Don. Well, I think it's, <clears throat> if this, this, the group that's been put together to study this doesn't ask for other alternatives and just looks at this plan and makes a decision based on that, they're not doing their jobs as we would expect people in those positions to do it. Just like William Penn said, right is right, even if everybody's against it, and wrong is wrong, even when everybody's for it. They need to take an honest look at what's good for this city, look at what the city needs to do, and, 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 and spend their money wisely in doing this. And the last word goes to you, John Murphy. I think the citizens of Kansas City need to have a vote on it. We are asking you now to put your uh, tray tables back and your seats back in the upright position because we're coming down to land because that is it for this program. Thanks to Don Hensley, Councilman Dick Davis, Scott Wagner and John Murphy. We very much appreciate you uh, giving of your time. We know there are many carriers with which you can choose, many places you could spend your time this evening. We thank you for spending it with us. Good night. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. This program is a partnership of the Kansas City Public Library and Citizens Project, an initiative of the Citizens Association of Kansas City committed to open government since 1934.